Yo! I am going to go through a few more things for my pop culture show where I look at toys that I've collected and try to find out a little bit about them, see if I can't find some history on some of the items, just to learn a little something. So the first one up is an Etch-A-Sketch. I was looking these up. Of course, we know what an Etch-A-Sketch is. I wanted to see how they were made. Anybody who's ever played with one, you've spent enough time with it to kind of already know exactly how it works. A stylus inside of it, and it's connected by two crossbars, and you control them with this, and it draws on the powder that goes on the screen, and you can shake it away, and it's gone. The powder in there is actually uh, aluminum powder, which they say is non-toxic. How do you make it non-toxic? No idea, didn't look it up. But uh, the entire thing was created in the 19, late 1950s, I wanna say, by a guy named Andre Casagnes. Casagnes? Casagnes. Anyway, he's a guy in France. He came up with the idea while he was, I guess he's an electrician or something, and he was writing on some filament on a piece of glass to mark something like he was doing some electronics of some sort or electrical work and saw that it showed up on the other side, gave him an idea. He did a prototype uh, which had pulleys and levers and he had a bunch of glass that he used for it. And then he took it to a toy show and tried to sell it. And everybody was fascinated by the concept of the idea. They loved it, except for the fact that he wanted way too much money for uh, for the rights to it. I guess he was asking for just thousands of dollars just for people to even uh, option for it. And then one company did, and they were called the Ohio Arts Company. It's the logo that's always been on there. And I've never known of anything else they made, which apparently they made one more thing, which was called like Magna Sticks or something like that. They were magnetic. They were like Legos, only magnetic, and you could make animals out of them. So they decided to make this. And one of the reasons they did was because the Ohio Art Company was actually just a guy who started a company uh, in Ohio. His first product was in the early 1900s, and it was, they were called Cupid Awake and Asleep, I think they were called, uh, frames. That might not be the exact same thing, but basically he created a lathe, metal lathing company that would create frames, and there were two of them, and one had a picture of Cupid that was asleep, and the next to it was a picture of Cupid that was awake. It was essentially, you know how you go to Target and you buy picture frames, and there are pictures in there as examples? They sold that and people bought them and put them on their walls and it became hugely popular. And it was just, it was, he was just building the frames, but everybody loved the pictures and they kept it. So they made tons of money off of that. So they decided they wanted to get into the toy business. And this was the first one that they got. And it so happened that they had a bunch of things to make frames. When they finally got it going and the prototypes were all good, uh, the, they advertised it on television and everybody said, this looked like a television and with television being a new thing it was like they kids liked the fact that it was like they were drawing on tv and that was the new popular thing so it just kind of everything aligned and everybody loved it and that's what it was other thing i found out was that ohio art actually sold the rights to uh the manufacturing of the etch -a sketch in like 2016 i want to say to a company in canada so now some other company actually has the rights to it and Ohio Arts decided that they were going to go back to uh, making metal lathing. That's what I know about Etch-A-Sketch. So this is an old book, of course, called uh, Janet Lennon at Camp Calamity. On the cover it says, Singing Star from the Lawrence Welk Show. It was actually made in... 1962. It turns out she is actually Janet Lennon from the Lennon Sisters, which I did know. They were a singing group uh, of sisters, Lennon Sisters, makes sense. And they did lots of appearances on like movies and television shows. And their first one was actually the Lawrence Welk Show, which I didn't know was around that long. And the way that got discovered was Lawrence Welk's grandson went to school with these girls. One time he was sick, Lawrence Welk was, he was at home sick. And basically his grandson brought the Lennon sisters over to sing for him, to make him feel better. It was an audition for sure. So 
they did. He loved them, and he signed them on to be a regular on the show. They debuted in like uh, on like Christmas Eve or something like that on one of the shows in like 1959. So from there, they became really popular. They sang all the time. They did appearances in movies. That's where they did all this. And then they started to market on it by creating things like coloring books, uh, like you know paper dolls, and by trying to create books like this. And the entire thing is they try to make it like Nancy Drew. She's a camp counselor, but things keep happening at the at the camp where she works. So she has to solve mysteries. Well, there are a few illustrations inside like that, but not a lot. And, you know, so the whole thing is she's trying to solve some mystery. Other thing I found out, and this is actually really sad, uh, weird transition, they were going to get their own television show in 1969. Like Jimmy Durante was going to was gonna host, or he was going to promote them. It was going to be Jimmy, Jimmy Durante uh, presents the Lennon sisters. And right before they debuted, it was supposed to be their breakout role. Their father was murdered by a crazy fan, a fan who believed that he was actually married to um, not Janet Lennon, but like in his mind, he thought that they were married. And the reason that he couldn't see, I wish I could remember which one it was, but it was one of the Lennon sisters. He believed it was the father that was keeping them apart. So he followed the father to a golf course. He was golfing one day and shot him, shot him like on the golf course. And then later on, uh, he shot him. He, the killer went home and shot himself. And apparently he had mailed a letter to their house. That was a picture of the father and a cutout of a gun to his head. And it said like this high noon or something like that. Really freaking creepy stuff. So that's horrible. Uh, but I found that all out just because I uh, got this book and she was in the Lawrence Buck show. So weird way to end that one, but that's what happened. They ended up uh, going on to do the show. It only lasted a year after they had, you know, some time to grieve and recover, but they're still around and performing today. So that's the Lennon sisters, uh, Janet Lennon at Camp Calamity. All right. So this one's kind of twofold. This one is what's known as a press out book. So it's of the Walt Disney movie, the black hole. I wanted to know more about press out books because what they were is they're like paper dolls, but you actually, they're like making models out of, out of uh, pages from the book. And then inside the book, they have entire scenes. Since they're press out books, you would push out these things here and then fold them and make the actual parts out of them. Here's one of the spaceships folded out. That's what this entire big thing here is. So it's an entire modeling thing. Wanted to find out more. I can't find the origin of them. They just started making them in 1960s. They did kind of start out more as um, uh, like make your own Valentine's Day cards is what it looks like. Like a lot of Valent, you'd get a sheet of like different Valentine's Day stuff and you could punch them out and make different cards out of them. That's all I really found out about it. So I decided to look up the movie, The Black Hole, because I realized I never, I don't think I ever saw this movie. Uh, it was a Disney movie that was released. Uh, at the time, there were popular movies where these, what were they called? They were uh, The Towering Inferno and The Poseidon Adventure and all that, where it was like something was just, things were crashing, buildings that were destructing, Towering Inferno. So this was one where it was going to be in space. Well, from the get-go, the whole thing was uh, riddled with tons of problems. They, uh, Disney had somebody write and produce the story, and as he was writing it, they wanted some rewrites, and the guy died, so they had to get somebody else to do it. Then uh, it kept changing hands. They wanted to make revisions. They decided to change their mind on which direction it should go, things like that. It finally got made. It, you know, it, it kind of got okay reviews. It was mixed reviews. So what they did is Star Wars came out around that time, and they were introducing a bunch of new special effects, and they wanted to use some for this, but also they had already been in production, and a lot of it was done with um, they would paint things there. So there were lots of like painted images and things that were used for like skyscapes and backgrounds and they were superimposing it. And they had a dude who painted all these big space backgrounds and stuff that they were going to use. He did like, I want to say they said like 150 of them and they ended up using 19. So poor guy, but I'm sure he got paid to promote the movie. Disney used to have this Sunday comic and it was called uh, the Disney tales of adventures or something like that. It was a Sunday comic. It was like, eight panels. They'd hire cartoon artists to basically draw images and stories based on things they released. 
So it was a cartoon that was literally just an advertisement. And at this time, they decided to make a cartoon to explain the story and actually fix some of the uh, huge plot holes that were in the movie and like some of the things like the science that didn't match up. So they created a series to advertise it in the Sunday comic that they made to explain some of the, the holes in the story and fix that. And one of the people that they hired to do it was Jack Kirby, who is like from Marvel and created the X-Men and all that kind of stuff. So that artist was hired onto it, looked up some of the artwork. It's really cool. So I'm going to check out more of that. It was the first movie that Disney released that was uh, rated PG. And it was because they said hell and damn in the movie. And also because apparently there's like a horrible death of like the captain at the end. So it was too much for the children. So from that point on, they did want to get more into adult roles. The fact that they released this on Buena Vista and uh, it kind of like didn't want to taint the name of that. That's how they created the next movie when they did uh, in more of an adult realm. They created Touchstone Pictures. And that's how Touchstone Pictures started was because they wanted to do more adult sci-fi type stuff. That's that. This is a Garfield, it's what's called a tray puzzle. So it's a picture and it's inside a tray. It's got a frame to do the stuff in. There it is. So you can fill it out that way. I wanted to find out who came up with the concept of tray puzzles because there's puzzles and then all of a sudden it was like, here's one that's on a card. Didn't really find anything, but found out interesting history of, uh, of puzzles in general. So, you know, that works. The first one they think was created uh, about the 1700s and it was actually for maps so what they did is they would paint maps on a giant piece of wood and then saw out the different sections of countries or regions or however they would do it and that's how they would it was just an active thing that they would go here's each part and you would put it together and that was your map it was not a jigsaw it was not one that locks together it was just cut out by the shapes and that's all it was and that's the way puzzles were for a really long time and then during the Depression, uh, puzzles actually became very popular because it was kind of an escape. To make them cheaper, they made them out of cardboard. But if you sneezed or something, or if you walked by too fast, or you opened a door and wind blew, the entire thing would fall apart and you'd, it'd be ruined. So that's when they finally started making interlocking pieces. So they did that. And during that time, the competition between wood and cardboard puzzles were actually very neck and neck because it was seen as more of fancy to get a, a, a wood puzzle. You'd be like, ooh, I can afford a wood puzzle. And then the people with the cardboard were like, I don't care. I want to do more puzzles. So wood puzzles started going more and more out of style. They upped their game in the cardboard puzzle thing and started doing, uh, what was it, fancy, fancy artwork uh, puzzles. Uh, they say the hardest puzzle ever made was they did a full-size version of a Jackson Pollock jigsaw puzzle. And there was no referencing or anything, and apparently it was just like super hard to, to do. But on a side note, interesting fact, and this one, I have a band that's called Lorenzo's Music. Interesting story, I did originally call it Lorenzo Music because I was watching the Bob Newhart show one night, and it said that the show was created by Lorenzo Music. Who, and I was like, that's a cool band name. So I called my band that. He was also the voice of Garfield. Well. He lived in Chicago. We played a few shows in uh, Chicago and he caught wind of this and he had his lawyer go, hey, could you send me one of your CDs so I could check out your band? And I'm like, oh boy. So we're like, sure. And, you know, hope this is okay. But just to be safe, we put an apostrophe S on the end and called it Lorenzo's music. And uh, that kind of solved the problem. Sadly, he died like a year after that. We never heard from him again. But there's a lot of death in this episode that I'm talking about. Uh, but anyway, so that was how we fixed it. So the one thing I wanted to say is, so Lorenzo Music was the voice of Garfield in the television show Garfield. He also was the voice of Bill Murray in the cartoon version of the Ghostbusters. And then later on in the Garfield movies, Garfield was voiced by Bill Murray, who was in the Ghostbusters, who Lorenzo Music did the voice of. That is what I got. That's, uh, that's, Jigsaw puzzles for you, and uh, that's the end of it. Hope that was all interesting enough, and uh, see you later. Let's stop this thing here.